Okay, we're back live here in SiliconAngle.tv. It's theCUBE uh, here live in uh, Cassandra Summit in Silicon Valley. I'm here with Yuri Cohen. Yuri, welcome uh, to theCUBE. The Thank you. And Jeff Kelly, my co-host uh, for this uh, event. Jeff, how are you feeling so far? I'm enjoying myself. A lot of energy we were just talking before we came on, and uh, it's just remarkable how big this conference is and how much, uh, how much energy there is. And, uh, yeah, having a really good time. So Uri, we talked to a lot of the uh, the alpha geeks, obviously from Datastacks as well as uh, Netflix. Um, Adrian was on, he was cool, talk about his demo. Um, I want to get your perspective. What's your take of the, of the event? And uh, share with the folks your take of what's happening here. And then what is happening that they might not know about? Share something uh, original. Okay, um, so my take. Um, I came here, I was expecting it to be like a medium to small event. Um, and then, I guess this morning, there were about 800 close to 900 participants, and it's, it's mind-blowing, right? It's like, uh, um, you know, tripling over the last uh, few years, um, so I was pretty amazed, and I was telling Jeff, it's, it's not just the amount of participants, it's actually the, uh, the focus, and it's, you know, the, the level of conversations that we're having with people, um, very professional, I mean, people are coming, and they are either, either engineers or engineering manager and looking for solutions, and they know their stuff, so it's, it's uh, we're very happy with it. I mean, it's, it's been really nice. Great. Yeah, I've, I've noticed the same thing. It's not uh, you know, not a lot of kind of novices coming here trying to well, let's learn a little bit about the technology. It's, it struck me as how kind of mature this, this ecosystem is uh, compared to just a few years ago. Uh, two years ago. So why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your spaces, kind of what you guys do, and then we can kind of go into some of the details of uh, what you guys are doing around Cassandra and the sure. uh, big data. Um, so we've been around for quite some time now. Um, we have two products. Um, the first one is called Zap. It's called for Extreme Application Platform. And start off as a, a distributed in-memory uh, database. Uh, kind of similar to what you see today with all the, with this Cassandra and other NoSQL databases. Uh, uh, we took it from a bit of a different perspective. It's all in-memory. It's, uh, it's transactional. And it's mostly targeted at uh, transaction processing. So. Um, our primary adopters were financial services uh, organizations that needed um, transactions and not lose any message. So it's a bit different from the requirements of NoSQL today. Uh, so that's one thing we do. And the other thing we do is uh, a product called Cloudify, uh, which is designed to take complex uh, multi-tier big data apps to any cloud environment. Um, and managing you know, big data apps is, 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 is not very easy, you know, especially if you're talking about multiple components, and you know, Cassandra is just one piece. Usually you have Hadoop and MapReduce on top of that, and your web containers and your SQL databases and caching layers, uh, so providing a way to manage all of that consistently and auto-scale it on any cloud environment, uh, that's something we do with Cloudify. What do you think about the big trend around solid state memory um, and you know, disks, et cetera? Uh, so it's changed the game, we heard from Adrian. It's obviously Cassandra's a nice use case of anyone who has solid state in their architecture. Obviously, that's where the market's going. How is it affecting cloud in particular? Cloud is now segmented on, and you know, with public cloud is all the big rage. OpenStack was a big proponent of creating this whole public cloud. Amazon, we know about. Adrian talked extensively about that. But also, the enterprises have on-premise data centers. And then you got this hybrid cloud. So private, private cloud, hybrid cloud, public cloud. Sort out what's happening in this space, because now you're seeing things span cross clouds. Sure. What's, the, what's going on in, that, in those areas right now? Uh, so I think it really depends on the type of organization you are, and um, um, actually one of the stuff I talked about in my session here is uh, how uh, cloud portability is not really kind of uh, uh, something uh, um, unique or, uh, of, of, you know, even if you're starting a small company, you need to be thinking about it today. Uh, because you know cases like Zynga and uh, Mixpanel, these guys have started off with small setups, and then went to public cloud, and then realized that you know for the scale they're they're at, they probably better off go back to at least some of their capacity to private clouds. Um, so I think uh, what we're going to see moving forward is uh, a mix of both, where part of the workloads, maybe the most sensitive ones, where you need the high the low latency. Um, are going to be focused on private clouds and you're going to see public clouds for most, you know, most of the rest of the stuff. What do you think of companies like Box.net that have been got huge valuations um, out there? I mean, they're basically just doing file sharing. I mean, is that cloud? Uh, I it's mean, that's consumer cloud, yeah. You can, it's, well, they, it's they, cloud. they claim they're doing enterprise. Um, yeah, but you know, they're not focused on 
enterprises building applications. They're not, they're not a platform. They're really a consumer product, and one of their customers is consumers within enterprises. So, um, not sure about the valuations. I'm, you know, I'm up to them. <laughs> Close to a billion dollars, um, but then again, it's okay. pretty amazing. I'm, you know, I can't tell if it's. Yeah. You, know, just you can say it. <laughs> Come on, you can say it. It's hyped up. John's trying. He's trying to I'm trying to extract. Yeah. No, I'm just no. I mean, I, yeah, they're putting a lot of PR saying you know they're enterprise grade, and you know mm -hmm. we cover Oxygen Cloud and mm -hmm. and uh, we cover Box and Dropbox. But you know, then I I, I think they're consumer applications. I mean, consumer applications in the cloud are great business models. You got a freemium, you are free, and then you got a premium. You kind of go freemium. Okay, cool. When you start doing enterprise level cloud, you have to. There's nuances there that are, that are table stakes security data portability, and certain data center kind of features that need to be in place, and it's mm -hmm. very difficult. Yeah. Uh, can you expand on that, that conversation? Because that's what people are trying to figure out. What does enterprise cloud mean? Enterprise ready, enterprise cloud. We know there's a lot of shadow IT going on with public cloud, mm -hmm. so that's okay. I think that's just competition. Developers want to play, and there's tools in the public cloud, and they, sure. they play out there, but when they pro prototype it, they got to get it to production. So that's been the big theme here. Talk about that. Getting something to production. So I've been shadow, doing some shadow IT, now I've got to bring it back to the enterprise and make that ready. So I think in terms of the way you would do that, um, public cloud versus private cloud is not really all that different. It, these are the same concerns, like you mentioned, security and, and portability and all these, uh, and all these, these concerns. Um, what I can say is that uh, when you're building an enterprise solution, uh, you can't neglect a lot of the things that people neglect when, when they go to public cloud. You, know, you, can't, you have to start for accounting for um, availability and what are the SLAs. And not everyone are Netflix, that they can actually build a huge infrastructure around that to be able to uh, you know, cope mm -hmm. with all those um, you know, failures and data center crashes and all that stuff. Um, so, if you want to do enterprise in the cloud, that means that uh, you're probably going to have to design your applications for that. So let me ask you about virtualization. Obviously, um, virtualization has been a game changer. We saw VMware evolve from a company that had a hypervisor. You had Citrix out there, and you know, Xan and Citrix. And then you know, VMware is now moving with that data uh, center focus or enterprise now with Cloud Foundry. So it's pretty sure. clear what they're doing, right? You know, Pat Gelsinger's in charge. VMware is going to be a whole different company than, than they were. Um, but is it viable with virtualization that is totally game changing? Also, another, you saw the Nasira was bought out by VMware for sure. you know, a billion dollars or something, like an yeah. amazing amount. Crazy. Again, they were the VMware for networking. Mm -hmm. That was the quote yeah. VMware of networking. Is there a cloud virtualization play like that where virtualization has absolutely changed the cloud? Is that what you guys are doing? And, and what is, is it that easy to just bucket something into a bucket and saying, you guys are doing virtualization in the cloud. Explain what that means, virtualization in the cloud. So, so we're actually doing, um, I would say something a bit different. Um, um, we're allowing you, if, if you have an application, right, if it's, even if it's a legacy application and it's very complicated, uh, we're going to allow you to take the same application and put it on your data center or on a virtualized environment or on a public cloud um, without changing a single line of code. Obviously, you know, it's, it's very important um, you know, for two, two purposes. Uh, one is when you're trying to decide where you want to deploy it, where you want to put this application, um, you want to be able to test things easily. You want to be able to uh, deploy the same application on multiple environments and see what, work, what works best for you, even across multiple public clouds. That's one thing. And then as your business evolves and your requirements change, uh, you want to be able to switch pretty easily. Um, what do you think about the database? So obviously, obviously infrastructure as a service, platform as a service has been a great enabler for uh, new things. Mm -hmm. Enterprises are realizing now they could do more things now with solid state. So internally inside the firewall or our on-premise, Solid State has offered up great new provisioning opportunities with, with having storage better, mm -hmm. making caching layers, so some coolness going on there. Sure. You got some coolness going on in the cloud. Um, what, what's happening in between there? If you're a developer, can you connect the dots there? I mean, is it that, is there a way to create a cloud infrastructure? Because if I'm an enterprise customer, I say, I want to do the cloud. I want to build my own cloud. How do they do that? Um, so, 
first of all, solid state is, I think it's a game changer, um, especially with the kind of stuff that Amazon is doing. And we've seen it, uh, if, if you attended Adrian's uh, talk this morning, um, it's really about doing a lot more with the same resources. Um, and traditionally what happened in cloud is two things uh, regarding IO and, and what, what happens with you know, just writing stuff to the disk on the cloud. So one thing is that it's very slow. Um, and if you compare a server in the cloud and a non-virtualized server in your own data center, sometimes would it would be tenfold faster, just one server, uh, just doing IO on that server. Um, so it's one thing the SSD is doing and um, the stuff that, that Amazon is doing now. The other thing is the, the um, let's say the fluctuations that you would experience uh, with traditional cloud, with, with IO and traditional cloud. So up until now, before you had this SSD, um, you could get a decent performance on average, but then you would get those spikes that, you know, something that would take you 30 seconds would suddenly take you 20 minutes. And for no apparent reason. So you have to accommodate for that. And, you know, you can just browse through the Netflix blog and see how they do that, like writing stuff for, you know, three or four locations just to accommodate for that. Um, so it's definitely a game changer uh, on that respect. Um, if you're building a private cloud, um, I would say SSD is definitely something you need to take into account. Uh, if you're an application developer, it really changes the way you can think of things. So we traditionally come from the in-memory database or in-memory caching uh, area. And SSD gives you a lot more flexibility in the transition between memory to disk. So you can have this kind of middle tier here that is almost as fast as in memory, but then it's, it's much more robust, it's much more scalable, it's, it can store much more so data. So Yuri, tell me what you think about the different horses on the track, as we say. Um, Mongo, Cassandra, HBase. That's a great question. You've got SimpleDB, you've got Dynamo, DynamoDB, the Amazon one. Um, would I miss anyone? Uh, probably a few, Ryak. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, couch, uh, you can couch, 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 yeah, release, couch. yeah there, there yeah. are a bunch of players there. Yeah, so break them down for us. Well, Mongo uh, seems to be the most vocal about against Cassandra. There seems to be that kind of developer crowd. HBase has emerged, that's Hadoop HDFS. Yeah. But anyway, is there the benefits? I mean, Cassandra, I was aware of Cassandra, so we want to you know, compare and contrast Cassandra versus some of those other ones. Okay. Is there a, a winning use case for each one? Um, that's what we're trying to explore. Yeah, definitely. So, um, Mongo, I would say the biggest benefit there is usability. Um, so, it's so easy to pick up and get started with that most developers would, you know, default on, on that database. Um, and I can understand why. And it's you got drivers for every language. So, no matter what you're doing, Ruby, JavaScript, Java, uh, there's a solution for you there. Um, Cassandra traditionally was a really good um, database as far as the distribution model goes, as far as the clustering goes. It's a much more, in my opinion, it's a more robust implementation than Mongo. It's, uh, in what ways? Distributed database or? Uh, in, in the way that, first of all, the algorithms there are more kind of pure. Uh, it's easier to set up because everything is symmetric. So if, if, if you want to set up Mongo in a cluster, you have uh, a bunch of roles and components there, and if you want to set up Cassandra, you just kickstart a few processes and they kind of figure out the roles between themselves. Uh, so it's e easier to do with Cassandra. Uh, where Cassandra uh, fell short up until recently is the usability part, uh, the API part. Um, two years ago, it was very hard to get started with. Um, it's still harder than Mongo, uh, but things are improving, and that's one of the stuff I'm seeing here is this great improvement in usability and the stuff that Netflix is doing, for example, around APIs. Um, so they took the Cassandra API and they created uh, their own kind of layer on top of that, which, mm -hmm. which makes things a lot, lot simpler to, uh, to work with. Uh, we have CQL, which is uh, uh, similar to SQL and allowing users that are familiar with SQL to kind of work with Cassandra without picking up on all the uh, unique terminology, so to speak. Uh, so I'm very, very optimistic about where that's going. Um, HBase traditionally was, um, um, it has its use cases. Obviously Facebook is a, big, is a big proponent of that. They've done a lot of work around uh, improving the code base in the last uh, 12 or even 18 months. Um, their inbox and all that uh, functionality is, is now based on HBase. Um, HBase itself, it's a bit more difficult to set up um, than Mongo and, and Cassandra because uh, it sits on top of Hadoop and then you need a Hadoop infrastructure to, uh, to begin with, and only then HBase. Uh, so in terms of setup, I would say it's the most complicated of the industry, but 
uh, both HBIS and Cassandra are very good at uh, um, write scalability mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, just accommodating for applications that have massive write requirements. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if we could talk about analytics a little bit. Cool. So, um, you know, certainly, you know, Cassandra known for, you know, really supporting real-time transactional applications, big data applications, but then when it comes to the analytics part, um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier uh, with Billy Bosworth, the CEO, talking about partnering with some of the BI players to do some analytics. Uh, I know Gigaspace has recently uh, rolled out some capabilities to kind yeah. of build your own real-time big data analytics platform. Sure. So yeah. big data analytics is hard enough, but when you add the real-time component, uh, now you're really talking about uh, some little challenges technically. Um, talk a little bit about both the technical challenge of building that kind of platform and really the use cases. What does it allow you, what kind of insights does it allow you to get that you can't get from a more traditional batch type of analytics? Sure, so, so um, in terms of, I mean the driver for that, right? Let's start with that. So everyone are, you know, Hadoop is very big and you see a lot of companies behind it and a lot of use cases, a lot of tools. Uh, so I'd say the ecosystem is pretty mature and, and robust, uh, but Hadoop is offline. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's very good at, uh, you can push a lot of data very quickly to Hadoop, but then if you want to process that, uh, that can take anywhere from minutes to hours. Yeah. Um, and that's, in many use cases, just not feasible, right? If, if you're building, if you're Twitter, for example, and you're building um, um, analytics dashboard, and if you're Facebook and, you're, and you have those widgets on, web, on people's website, you want to give them the insights as fast as you can because that means money. If I'm publishing some content on my website, and I'm seeing that it's not getting the traction I want, it's getting mm -hmm. negative traction, I want to change it very fast. I want to be able to do that uh, in real time. It doesn't help me that Hadoop can give me the insights a day or two days later. Mm -hmm. um, so we're seeing a lot of um, real-time analytics tools um, being created. Um, so Twitter Storm is another framework that people are talking about, kind of the online version of Hadoop. Um, What'd you hear about that? Um, Do you play with it at all? Or? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, it's, it's, I like it a lot. I mean, it's very good for what it does. Um, I think it's going to pick up a bit more. It's kind of the real-time version of Hadoop. So instead of pushing data to HDFS and then kind of processing it and offline, basically you process the data as it comes in. Mm -hmm. Kind of passes through that real-time analytics layer, and then you can store that data in Hadoop yeah, and do uh, later uh, analytics if yeah, that's what you're Yeah, but you want to do the, the real-time stuff as it comes in because that's, that's, what, that's when it matters, okay? So simple analytics, you can do obviously pattern analysis and uh, I don't know, uh, uh, fraud detection, stuff like that, but what you can do is you can actually uh, uh, count things, uh, do some simple queries, uh, all the stuff, for example, if you want to build a, build a web analytics dashboard, that's, that's, that's very relevant. If, if you want to, uh, for example, a lot of our customers have been doing that for years with financial services, like processing trades and, mm -hmm. and ticks and stuff like that, if you want to do it online. Uh, so that's the kind of stuff that you can do with, with real time. Uh, so we did around, we had this in-memory data grid platform so we built some eventing capabilities around that to be able to, to handle these kind of workloads mm -hmm. and these kind of scenarios. Interesting, so kind of, you know, it, it, is it alert based, an alert based system, whereas where you detect anomalies and then you kind of push that, that information to, to either to, a, to another application or process or to a human uh, to take some kind of action, is that kind of? So it's up to you, it's more of a development platform that mm -hmm. allows you to distribute the processing of those events across multiple nodes. Um, to store information in memory in a reliable fashion, uh, to do it transactionally, um, and basically give you all the framework that you need to be able to build such applications. So, so what are the challenges around doing that kind of work, uh, real-time analytics in a big data environment versus, you know, we've, there, complex event processing, EP engines have been around for a while, and sure. as you mentioned, financial services firms have been doing that kind of thing with, you know, smaller data, uh, data volumes and maybe not quite as uh, high velocity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what are some of the challenges, technically speaking, when it comes to applying uh, CEP-like technology, real-time streaming analytics to big data? So it's about the sheer scale of things, right? So if, if you're, if you have, uh, enough capacity in one server to process events, um, then you can do it much more easily, right? You can, uh, because you have a single source of information that's co-located with mm -hmm. where you do the processing. Um, you don't need to uh, think about how you distribute the data, how it's load balanced across those, uh, uh, those servers, uh, what kind of data you would need to access from, from each node, mm -hmm. right? Because if you're distributing and then you're processing an event, and then you realize as you're processing this event that you need data from another server mm -hmm. or from mm -hmm. a bunch of other servers, it's not going to scale. So there's a lot more thinking about what's your use case, what's the most important piece of your application that you want to scale. 
versus traditional frameworks. Hmm. Uh, that's a challenge uh, with, with those kinds of platforms. So Yuri, we're going to end this end the segment, but I wanted to uh, ask you one last time. Share with us uh, what you're working on, your framework, what your company's doing. Get a quick plug in, um, and what you're doing here at uh, at the event. Okay, so I mentioned the two products that we have. Um, so we'll start with, with Cloudify. Uh, so with Cloudify, what we've done, Cloudify itself is, like I said, it's a framework for uh, pushing big data apps to the cloud. Uh, one of the key components that we're seeing in the market, our prospects and customers are demanding for is Cassandra. So we built a very nice, uh, um, we call it recipe for Cassandra, which allows you to embed a Cassandra tier within, uh, uh, within your big data application, push it to any cloud environment, scale it dynamically, um, and basically accommodate for all of the management aspects of, of what it takes to manage uh, Cassandra on the cloud. Um, and as far as the other plat the, the Zap platform is concerned, um, we've built an offering where um, you can actually um, put this in-memory event processing uh, grid in front of Cassandra mm. and process stuff as it comes in real time, uh, transactionally, and then you know push it to Cassandra uh, as a backend and then do the long-term stuff uh, over Cassandra store information, you know, with lim un almost unlimited capacity, uh, which you can't do within memory. Awesome. Yuri Cohen, VP of Products at Gigaspaces. Thanks for coming on theCUBE, appreciate it. Thanks, uh, we'll appreciate be right back with me. our next guest after this break. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks,